So what do we see on MRI in venous malformations? Well, here's this boy again with his shoulder uh, expansions and shoulder swelling. There were no external markers uh, to suggest this was a malformation. And in fact, this was soft and was slightly compressible. Um, and this is the T1, which is relatively um, iso-intense to muscle. T2, it's hyper-intense. T1 following contrast shows contrast enhancement within the lesion here, but actually it's usually non-uniform. You don't get uniformity in the contrast enhancement, uh, which is quite different to the proliferative infantile hemangiomas, for example. There's a little telltale sign of a signal void on the T2, and this is a phlebolith. This is a calcified blood clot. They can be numerous throughout these malformations, and clinically, you can sometimes feel them under the skin. They feel like a little peanut under the skin. The areas of white on the, sorry, high signal on the T1 is some fat, which is interdigitated throughout the lobulated surface of the uh, venous malformation. So MRI is extremely useful. It's very tissue specific. Ultrasound is also good. We use it not just for diagnosis. We do not use it for diagnosis with extensive lesions if it involves the entire leg, for example, or the entire arm. We would use MRI if we need to. And, but ultrasound can show little lakes. Ultrasound is extremely useful to guide our uh, to guide our treatment in interventional radiology. There is no doubt about it. And ultrasound is also very useful when we see children in clinic, and sometimes we're not sure, and then we can put the ultrasound on them, and we can try we can make the diagnosis if clinically it's difficult. So they have maybe some more solid structure to them as well. You can see the septi. You can see phleboliths. Here's a venous malformation with this calcified blood clot with an acoustic shadow. And interestingly, venous malformations. Here's a ten. Actually, it's near the, uh, near the ankle, and in fact, this venous malformation here is engulfing in surrounding tendons, and we see them surrounding engulfing tendons and arteries as well. So there are different types of venous malformations, but we categorize them as either focal, multifocal, or diffuse. So here's a solitary venous malformation in the subcutaneous tissue. Actually, an excellent one uh, to be surgically excised rather than to have interventional radiology. This is a multifocal venous malformation. There's some expansion to the calf in this child. And there are multiple intramuscular venous malformations. You can see with numerous um, signal voids due to phleboliths. This, uh, I find actually, if we're looking at an extremity, an arm, or a leg, the first sequence I tend to look at actually is a coronal T2. It gives us an excellent overview of the extremity. It's very easy to localize things and then go and look in more detail at, at, at other um, sequences and, and other planes. But these uh, signal voids represent uh, phleboliths, which gives the clue and the multilopulated appearance on the, the two-weighted MR. This is the third type, so there's focal, multifocal, and diffuse. So you can see this extensive vascular stain in this child's leg, and on the T2 MR, you can see much of the muscle in the thigh and in the subcutaneous tissue here is replaced with this high signal which is due to, to blood pooling within the uh, venous malformation. There is no question when you see something like this, even on imaging, uh, without, if you don't happen to see the patient, but hopefully you will see the patient, that in fact this is, um, this is a venous malformation. It is the group, the diffuse group, who have the associated coagulopathies within the, particularly this group of diffuse venous malformations, otherwise known as localized intravascular coagulopathy. So they have this LIC within the lesion. Sometimes it can become disseminated, but usually it's confined to the muscle. And I know the group in um, Belgium, um, certainly in Brussels, uh, have uh, re uh, reported this and in Paris. And the practical importance actually is because if you, if ever some children are operated on, and I hope not many children with something like this would ever be operated on, it can be, be a bloodbath because of the coagulopathy associated with the uh, venous malformation. So venographically, there are two types, either sequestrated or non-sequestrated, meaning when you inject them, they do not connect with draining functional veins, or they actually, when you inject them, the venous malformation, they connect, that therefore being non-sequestrated. And they involve many tissues, as I said, the skin, membranes. Here's a cross-sectional MR image uh, of a limb, and you can see it's intramuscular, subcutaneous. It's intramuscular in the hand of this child. I showed you this image before where there's diffuse disease in the thigh and the upper calf. In fact, you can see on this axial T2 extensive intramuscular replacement with the venous malformation and in the subcutaneous fatty tissues. 
intra-articular around the knee and also leading to a chronic arthropathy. Lymphatic formations are actually quite different. However, they are, again, hemodynamically inactive and slow flow. They are due to uh, vascular morphogenesis affecting lymphatic channels, again, around about the fourth week of in utero life. And what is the end result is that there are either small vesicles or large pouches filled with lymphatic fluid. So you get these lymphatic spaces within the soft tissues and we, we, de we divide these lymphatic malformations nowadays into microcystic or macrocystic, depending on the size of the cyst. Anything that is smaller than one centimeter uh, is a microcyst. Anything larger is a macrocyst. And you can get either microcystic disease, macrocystic disease, or combinations of both. And the microcystic disease generally involves the skin, mucous membranes, soft tissues, viscera, and bone. And macrocystic can often involve deeper tissues. These are three clinical examples of a child with what we used to describe as having a cystic hygroma. Some people would describe this child as having a lymphangioma, and some, some people would describe again this child with this, with this slight bulging in the left side of the neck as having a lymphangioma. The, this is old terminology. If we call these lymphangiomas, it implies they are the oma part, it implies they are tumors, they're not, they're vascular malformations. So we've tended to go away from using the word cystic hygroma or lymphangioma. This actually is a mixed lymphatic malformation with macro and microcysts. Um, and lymphatic malformation can present in various ways with tissue enlargement, which may either be focal, as you can see this focal expansion of the uh, forearm here, or diffuse where the entire upper extremity <coughs> and actually part of the chest wall is enlarged. They can sometimes get pain and acute swelling. Sudden, expans sudden expansion in these lymphatic malformations is due to acute spontaneous hemorrhage or acute spontaneous infection in these lesions. Um, here's some tissue expansion in the chest wall of this baby. There are some little telltale vesicles on the skin giving us a clue to the diagnosis. There is uh, a series of, as you can see, on the tongue of this child, both due to all these are lymphatic malformations and also sometimes you can get weeping of fluid and blood from these vesicles and sometimes you can get, like in the extensive intramuscular venous malformations, you can get a localized intravascular coagulopathy which is extremely rare as happened in this baby who has a chest wall lymphatic malformation. There's a macrocyst here. Much of the chest, wall, chest and abdominal wall was involved with the lymphatic malformation and unfortunately this baby died at uh, four days of age with intracranial hemorrhage due to the um, localized intralesional coagulopathy which became disseminated. That's a very, very rare event, but it can happen.